Okay, good evening, everyone. My name is Pat Hanlon. I'm the vice chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, and I've been designated as chair for tonight's meeting. I'm calling this meeting to order at 7.34 uh, p.m. Uh, I'd like to, at the outset, confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present. Members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, Christian Klein. Here. Roger DuPont. Here. Daniel Ricardelli. Here. Vanket Holy. Here. Elaine Hoffman. Here. And Adam LeBlanc. Here. Um, for town officials, is Vincent Lee here? I think he must be. Yes, he is. I'm here. And I know that that uh, I don't see whether Marissa Lau is here from the planning department. Apparently not. Um, in a moment, we'll get to uh, the main item on the agenda, which is a continuation of the public hearing uh, in uh, 10 Sunnyside. Uh, but the first item on our agenda is a, an administrative item for which there'll be uh, no uh, no uh, public uh, uh, comment. Um, it's a case that we that we decided we voted on on uh, May 23rd in 3749 12 Puritan Road. Uh, I, I circulated an opinion to the board. Uh, on this weekend and uh, received a few comments, which uh, were mostly of a typo sort of na nature, which were all made. And uh, I s circulated rather late this evening, uh, the final version uh, uh, proposed for approval. Um, so I wonder if there's anyone who has any further uh, comments or questions on the uh, draft decision in this case. Or if not, the chair will entertain a motion to approve the decision. Mr. Hanlon, I move. Mr. Klein, I move approval of the written decision for 12 Puritan Road. Second, seconded by Mr. Dupont. Is there any discussion? Uh, if not, I'll run through the roll. Uh, Mr. Dupont, uh, aye. Ms. Hoffman, aye. M Mr. Holy, aye. Mr. Klein. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Is that an aye? Yes, aye. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Ricardelli? Aye. And the chair votes aye, so the uh, decision uh, is approved. Um, the next item on our agenda is the, is the main business of tonight's meeting. Uh, it's the uh, public hearing, a continuation of the public hearing in the uh, uh, 10 Sunnyside uh, 40B application. Um, I wanted just to check and make sure that the people, in addition to the ones I've already called out who uh, need to be here, are here. Uh, Mr. Haverty, our counsel. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Haverty. Um, uh, Ms. Ms. Schwartz, for the applicant. Uh, and Ms. O'Connor, I'll, I'll let you okay. introduce the rest of your team. You know which who, who's going to have a role tonight. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Good evening to everyone. Tonight we have presenting on behalf of UTL Nick Burens, who is the uh, principal, and Rachel Lane. Uh, they will be presenting the revisions uh, and responses to the uh, questions and uh, uh, raised by the ARB and the board. Uh, we have David Schlack, um, I hope I'm saying this right, Schlack Lecker from Sammy Otis, who will be updating the site civil um, drawings. Uh, we also have Kate Keenan from Offshoots, uh, who will go over the landscape design plan. So that those will be the people who will be uh, presenting tonight. I did want to let the board know that uh, uh, Ms. Schwartz and I did meet with the Broadway Neighbors Coalition. Uh, last week, um, I know Ms. Janowitz, who Janowitz is on the call. I don't know if Vince is on the call. Um, and we did discuss uh, some of the concerns relative to the Alewife Broadway intersection, but generally, and uh, Sue can correct me if I'm wrong, it's a larger picture um, that needs to be addressed between um, the state, Arlington, and Somerville. Um, so uh, there was some talk about potentially uh, putting a uh, 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 
a walkway there, you know, a striping it. Uh, but we're going to continue having that discussion. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Connor. So before we get any started any further, I need to read the introduction to remote meetings, which we're about to have. This open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely consistent with an act making appropriations for the fiscal year 2023 to provide for supplementing certain existing appropriations and for certain other activities and projects, which was signed into law on March 29, uh, uh, 2023. Um, the Public bodies, according to that law, may be meet remotely as long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing, and we will have a public comment period uh, on this application tonight. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. So please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of uh, means uh, and others folks may be able to see you, your screen name or another identifier. Please take care not to share in personal information and anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask that you please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the meeting's agenda or in the town's website, unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along uh, using the uh, posted agenda. And with that being said, uh, like to recognize uh, the applicant. We'll start with Ms. O'Connor to be the mistress of ceremonies uh, for tonight's presentation. Thank you. I would ask you, Teal, if they could um, provide the board with their update. Sure, I'll just do a quick introduction. I think Rochelle is gonna present our revised design materials, but I wanted to remind the board and other folks that are on the call that we submitted this presentation last week in advance of the hearing, as well as written comments to the, uh, or written responses rather to the comments that we received from the town on April the 23rd. Um, and we also provided updates to the civil engineering plans that were related to some of those comments and requested uh, by the board. So hopefully you all received those and were able to review them and share them as necessary before the hearing. Yes, um, thank you, I'll, Mr. Burns. You're welcome. I'll turn it over to Rochelle. I think the sequence is gonna be uh, architecture and design, and then landscape, and then civil engineering, um, as laid out in the presentation that we shared with you all earlier. I think you're on mute, Rochelle. <laughs> Hi, okay, well, <laughs> sorry about that. And thank you. Thanks everyone, good evening. Um, I'm, we're starting as Nick um, mentioned with response to the ZBA memos uh, that we received. Um, and the first couple of slides addresses the questions around uh, materiality. So on the slide we're showing um, a materials approach diagram that articulates um, our design thinking around the application of materials. Um, so we're starting from the, the, you know, the sidewalk up the ground, the ground level, the pedestrian level, where we've got, um, where we're, where we've got a design of a sort of a plinth level of brick and metal screening, um, where materials, solid materials um, that are appropriate for, for the ground use. And then on the residential levels above, we're showing um, sort of a, an approach that's more neutral and lighter in, in both um, color and, and pattern and textures. Um, and we're using some compositional devices to help break down the scale um, with painted accent panels that you can see in the blue. Um, you know, it's, it, it, you'll see in the front, we've had that breakdown along the facade. Um, and then we've got the reveals the vertical reveals at the rear of the building, which is over on the right. Um, the volume is more um, 
it's sort of more maximal volume, um, volumetric approach. And so we've taken the approach of our horizontality with the continuous cell and the grouped windows that are highlighted with accent panels to help um, sort of break the massing down um, and create a compositional approach. So here is a uh, you know, rendering that is um, seen from Broadway um, over by the health, um, the health center across the, across the parking lot. Um, there will be a, a fence at the rear of the building um, can't really see it here, but there will be one at the rear of the lot, along with um, a planting screen. Um, we'll, uh, you know, Offshoots is on the call with us tonight, and they'll talk more in depth about the, the approach to the trees and to the plantings there. But the intention is to provide a, a good buffer and a, a, you know, a healthy planted buffer um, with native species. Here's a close-up of that rear facade. Um, demonstrating um, the approach of how we are looking at the materials, the way that the patterning, um, you know, changes with the cladding and the accent panel, um, the continuous fill to articulate the horizontal, um, you know, edges, and then grouping the windows um, for creating compositional breakdown of, of the overall facade. Over on Sunnyside, um, here is a view, a uh, close-up view of the garage entrance. So you'll see um, between the brick bays, we've got um, infill, um, metal perforated or metal mesh um, infill panels. Um, they'll be of architectural quality. Um, the idea is to have both a sense of um, transparency, visibility, additional sort of layering through a material that provides screening um, and a sense of warmth and tactility. Above, we're taking a similar approach with the railing. So we're kind of having that re material relationship with the perforation and the screening, but we're tying more into the, um, the scheme, the color scheme of the residential palette above. These are some images of um, precedents to demonstrate some of the ideas that we're talking about. Um, the idea that um, with the perforated me or mesh panels that you've got a sense of um, visibility. Um, the image on the left shows, um, you know, that the, the way that you are able to see through and yet have that sense of security towards the evening. Um, but overall with these textures and patterns, you get a sense of tactility um, and richness at the ground level. And so tying in some of those, you know, those brick patterns with, with relief, um, we're looking here in this rendering at the um, residential entry. And then further off to the left, we've got the entry to the storefront entry to the office programming. So, so if we're taking that patterning perforated, you know, type of language that we I just showed a few slides ago, um, the the patterning and and um, texture continues on through the brick um, here at the residential entry with with punched windows um, to create a sense of solidity um, about you know an edge boundary container for the residential entrance. By contrast, um, the treatment at the corner for the offices is something that's um, really visible and open, um, enabling connectivity, um, visual connectivity to the street. I'm now gonna switch gears and talk about the approach to lighting. So um, this is in response to some of the questions that came up around lighting and comments um, that had come up in previous conversations. Um, what we have been prioritizing for lighting are um, highlighting the building entrance, um, having inviting, inviting to the entrances with, you know, with well-lit entrances, um, providing a good level of illumination around the perimeter of the building um, for both the residents and also for the sense of pedestrian safety along Sunnyside. This is um, also the, the approach towards the side 
entrances on either side of the building going to the stairs or to, you know, back towards the bike um, or garage entry over to the left. Um, and also providing um, adequate lighting in the garage um, so that you're able to um, see through um, providing the double sense of security, both through, you know, the screening and also the lighting that there's just good visibility. Um, at the same time, we're, we're aware of spillover and we'll be sure to provide, you know, the appropriate guards so that there's no um, spillover light onto um, the street or, um, you know, um, up above. So, um, yeah, this is, this is overall lighting approach. Um, moving over to part two, these are comments, responses to comments that were recorded and, um, We'll start with the question around how we're addressing mail and packages. The mailboxes will be located to the right um, upon entry into the building in the lobby. So in plan view, you'll see it there um, over on the left side of the slide. And then you'll see an elevation of that wall over on the right side. Um, so it'll be, you know, sufficient number for 43 units. It'll be within accessible reach. The package room will be a secured room um, and you'll see that sort of across the way adjacent to the meeting room. Um, if you can see where my mouse is, that's the package room. Um, so the dimensions there are provided, there'll be you know, an open counter and some shelving to help organize packages, um, but it, it'll be behind a door, so it, it'll be secured. There were questions about the EV charging stations. Um, so here's the, the approach that we're taking towards providing both EV ready for day one use um, for charging stations. And then uh, additionally, spaces that have the capability to be set up for, um, for EV charging. The requirement through FIA certification is to have two spaces that are EV ready. So that's ready to use on day one. And five EV capable, that's a 20% um, requirement coming from the town as of July 1st, 2023. Um, so what we're proposing increases the number to four day one EV ready. And the driving force here is accessibility, making sure that we're, we've got um, enough to cover ADA spaces. Um, so we're providing a broader, a broader um, a broader reach for EV capacity in the parking garage. In terms of the building height and questions around the building height, um, we wanted to um, address the, the common questions around average grade, which is taking the grade from four sides of the building and averaging them out. Uh, and if you recollect the, the site, um, the, the grading picks up as we move towards the rear of the building. And so the average grade falls to approximately 15 feet and seven inches, which is pretty close to the um, finished floor of the first floor, yielding a building height of 56 feet and two inches. And then um, we're showing some shadow studies here that we've conducted. I'll start with the summer solstice. Um, you've got the shadows casted 9, 12, 3, and 6 p.m. Um, and these studies, what you see in the gray are existing conditions in terms of the buildings that are here today and the shadows they cast. And then in the blue will be the shadows cast from the new building. So we're finding that the um, proposed building will not be casting shadows on residential houses, you know, in the surrounding neighborhood. We're finding, we, our findings are similar for the fall and spring equinoxes. And finally, with winter solstice, when the sun is at its um, lowest in the sky, we're, we're finding that um, the rear, the shadow of the building sort of grazes the rear lots along 
Silk Street, um, and it's it's pretty long towards Michael Street. There are some shadows there um, in existing conditions, um, and so there's sort of you know not additional significant casting with the new building um, towards 3 p.m. towards the end of the day. So that's the that's the uh, image you see on the right side. Okay, um, so that's it for the architectural responses. Um, shall we move on to the landscape architect architecture? Thank you. Let's why don't we go through the whole presentation and then we can get questions from the board on on uh, on any part that they feel moved to inquire about. Sounds good. Well, this is Kate Kennan from Offshoots. We're the landscape architects on the project. We met many of you on our site visit out a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so we shall just say next slide as we can move through all these. Great. So um, the first thing that's really exciting about the site, obviously, is the location. It's such a nice place to put housing because of its location near the Greenway and also being surrounded by the habitat area that's both the cemetery and around the, um, the Greenway. As you know from being out there, the, the site is really devoid of uh, a lot of vegetation now, and the, and the vegetation that is there is kind of invasive, spontaneous plants. Next slide. The existing street, uh, go back one, thank you. The existing streetscape that is at Sunnyside um, is that there is a six and a half foot walkway in the left, if we're uh, in this upper left-hand image, um, a 25 foot six inch street, then there are street tree pits that are actually three feet wide, three feet six with the curb, and then a four foot kind of um, area that you can cross behind the trees. It makes for a nice proportion to the to the street where you can still um, come by the trees with uh, an, enough of a four foot crossing to be able to, to make way, way by ADA. But these are important because of course we wanna to relate to the existing trees on site and also create you know a nice new streetscape um, amenity as we go forward. So next slide, please. So in the ground floor plan, what we end up having is um, around the building, we're looking at a landscape move of two kind of ideas. The first one is the streetscape out in the front. And then the second is this idea of a native plant bird, what we're calling it a bird ribbon or a habitat mix around the outside that would be a buffer screening with a lot of tall vertical trees. So I'll talk about each of these separately. So first we'll talk about the streetscape in the front. There are uh, a series of five new street trees coming in around, along the front that we're proposing as well as bike racks. Um, and then some smaller ornamental trees uh, closer to the building with some ornamental plantings underneath those, all of it being native species. Next um, slide, please. So when we zoom into the streetscape, what you can see are the dimensions that are being proposed here. Now, this is the same dimensions that Util had previously shown um, in their concepts, which I think works really well. Like I mentioned, with the if we're really meeting the existing condition that shown previously is that uh, the total sidewalk space is a seven foot uh, sidewalk, um, three feet for the, the planter, the, the, the tree pit, four feet for behind the tree pit, and then the tree pits themselves are three feet by 10 feet long, so a good ample space to get a good sized tree to grow. Um, and then the idea is as those are kind of spaced equally along the street with these bike racks that have eight foot clear between them. Um, next slide, please. And you, you can, um, and so here we provided uh, a more blown up, um, I know we provided a, a, a blown up, more detailed planting plan. This lists all of the exact species that we're proposing to use and where. Um, and I'll just go through the overall um, objective of both aesthetics and ecologically. Next slide. Basically, the street trees along the front, the larger um, trees, we're looking at native oak species, again, to reconnect to that alewife corridor. So um, we're looking at a variety of large big oaks on the sunny side there. Um, the second line down shows the smaller um, ornamental trees that we're proposing along the building to be able to, to break up that facade a bit. And then the underplanting of the native shrubs and ground covers that we're proposing below that um, is shown there as well. All of these are really thought through for salt tolerance because we have to be really careful in an urban condition and and um, and pollution tolerance as well, just because of the you know uh, difficulty in living in an urban condition. Next slide, please. 
And then the idea is in the back in the bird ribbon habitat mix is that we actually use many more of these um, columnar trees. So you can see in the second row, the columnar pin oak, columnar swamp right oak, the Armstrong red maple, um, and some of these uh, hybrid cottonwoods um, is the idea that we could plant those in that smaller space and get some good verticality and green along the side of the building. Um, and then uh, the next slide is um, kind of underplanting that with this series of more um, habitat oriented shrubs that we find natively on, in the alewife um, corridor. And then next slide, the ground cover planting that we would plant underneath them, which is just this idea of a very low maintenance ground cover that would be able to form um, almost a green mulch so that we're not constantly having to put down bark mulch underneath it. Um, and then the next slide. Um, for the roof deck, you can see in the upper right hand corner, it shows a key plan of where the roof deck is on the second floor of the building. The idea for the roof deck here is to create um, a nice play, a place for the residents to go. They're in gray, you come out from the roof deck from the building, you're able to walk around the edges of the site in gray with an, uh, an occupiable deck on the inside. But surrounding that is this planted area that both separates the units from the deck itself, also providing this opportunity for larger raised planters to be able to get enough soil volume that we could put some significant size plant material and trees in it to provide some shade. So the dark green all along the outside um, and along the south side would be these larger plants um, all kind of ringing the space. And then on the inside where it says the at grade planting is just a planting at the level of the deck that would then, um, you would be have the cir circuitous route around the outside as a walkway and then you'd be walking through this garden as you, as you move through it. Um, next slide, please. Um, the kind of inspiration images of what this would look like, this upper left-hand corner really shows that idea of what those raised planters might look like with soil and plant volumes in them. On the, um, the right-hand side, showing the difference between kind of a raised planter and what that at-grade planting or the planting at the level of the deck would also look like. So we're kind of tiering it to create a sense of space. And the beauty of this kind of um, a flexible roof deck scheme, the next slide, is that um, we can kind of put um, site amenities on it that can be flexible. So it could be changed from, you know, of course, like a cornhole game or some sort of yoga practice to movable furniture, or ping pong table or whatnot. But it's nice because it gives us some flexibility. Next slide, please. Um, lastly, the planting plan provided here calls out the, spe the species that we'd be looking at, the roof deck. Again, all native, really pulling, uh, you know, hyper locally from what we would see on the uh, on the Ilwife corridor to really try to replenish that urban seed bank with species that we want to see rather than um, the invasive species that are currently present on the site. And then next slide. The images for those shown here is just that it is, this is um, more of a, a, a drier, sunny plant community that you would see um, because we are on the south side there and we'll get a lot of uh, warm sun. But the idea is about having seasonal interest as well. So thinking about winter and fall color as we move through the seasons as well as flowers. And then the next slide. This is just the understory because we also do love pollinators. And the idea here is we would add some ornamental interest in that kind of understory layer uh, of the plant materials as well. All right, and I think that is kind of the concept of the landscape wrapped up. I believe it's now on to civil drawings. Thank you, Kate. I'm Jeffrey Pilot from Samuels Consultants. I'm gonna I'm filling in for David tonight, and uh, we'll go through the uh, the comments from the town engineer and how we address them. Next slide, please. Uh, starting with the site lay, lay, layout plan, uh, it's been updated to show the pedestrian uh, warning surfaces and the tactile warning strips um, in the sidewalk and at the garage and driveways. Uh, as Kate mentioned, the uh, the tree wells have been uh, revised to three feet uh, wide along the curb to match the existing sidewalk in front of the adjacent building. Um, next, uh, so and then we've also added uh, manhole identifications uh, to the site plan uh, per the request of the town engineer. All all structures are labeled now. 
Um, next slide, please. On the uh, utility sheet, uh, we are we added the proposed electrical surface uh, to be underground to replacing the overhead wire uh, per the town engineer comment and conflict. A uh, sewer cleanout has been added uh, ten feet uh, from the uh, from the building as a cleanout, and the proposed fire department is uh, recommended by the fire department. The fire hydrant is recommended by the fire department to have the. Uh, on the same side of the street and close to the fire department connection located to the southeast of the corner of the building, hence that location. Um, next uh, slide, please. The stormwater management plan has been uh, revised to show the stumps on the structures. Uh, proposed area drain one um, with a sump of two feet and the foundation drain now outlets to the proposed dry well in the bottom right-hand corner of the site. Uh, the comment from ARB noted the potential for high groundwater in the area. Uh, so we acknowledge that and we will be doing soil testing uh, during design development to identify the water table elevation. Also uh, noted by the town engineer, uh, it was requested to uh, include inspection ports on the infiltration system and those are now shown on the on the plan i believe that addresses all the comments from the town engineer great thank you Welcome. is there any excuse me is there anything more in this in this part no that's everything mr hamlin okay so bear with me while i try to bring you all back since i There we go. I think so. I would, the uh, does the board have any uh, questions or comments on the presentation that you've just seen, uh, Mr. Chair? Mr. LeBlanc, I have a a few that relate to a couple of different sections. Um, I can start actually here is maybe a good one well, with the with the civil. Sure. Uh, so one thing um, that I was looking at. Um, and kind of reviewing this site a little bit more is we know we have the um, the fuel, uh, Almont fuel right next door and where the transformer is, that is like their kind of driveway. So I was wondering if there was any plans for any bollards um, to the right side of that transformer to protect it from any errant fuel trucks. Because um, that also might be a requirement from uh, Eversource as well. Right. In order to that meet meet that requirement uh, for proposed transformers, uh, we'll be adding bollards uh, around that. Okay. For vehicular, specifically. Mr. Lubon. Yep. Uh, and going back to our uh, landscaping, um, I had a couple of questions about that. Uh, with the proposed landscaping. There's like a lot of trees around the building itself, and I was just curious how tall we're expecting those trees to grow. Um, you know, are they going to be impeding kind of getting some natural light into those second floor units? Um, I see the benefit of having all these trees. They provide some nice shade to the building to help keep it a little bit cooler, um, but just also thinking about making sure tenants have adequate natural light. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, they are, it's a mix. Um, there's some things that get into the 12 foot range. There's some things that do get into the 30 foot range. The idea is that you have a mix so that we can kind of alternate with the window blocks that Rochelle had shown earlier, because there are some of those painted panels and other things that we can get some of that height between. But it's a good comment and we'll take a look at the exact spacing as we move further into development to make sure that we kind of avoid some of the big views. Yeah, that'd be that'd be good. Um, and my last kind of comment um, is going to the um, the roof deck. Um, some of the precedent images that you showed, um, some of the planting beds are kind of harsh, hard materials, uh, especially being a little high. I'm just thinking of, um, you know, it's a family building. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, there's potentially kids running around and um, I have heard of other issues on other sites of <laughs> using a harsh 
um, metal kind of for these planting beds that it um, isn't ideal. So I'm just curious of what your what your exact kind of thoughts are for materiality for these raised planters. Yeah, thinking right now of a thin metal edge, the reason we love to do that is because it um, doesn't have a lot of width, so we're able to maximize the amount of planting volume. We don't picture these, you know, being any higher than, you know, about two feet at sort of their highest point because we'd be able to go down and get about a foot. And we'd like to see the soil volume for the larger trees at, you know, about two and a half to three feet. So they are not real high. Um, the idea is, as again, as we move into design development, they might tip a little bit. They may change so that you can really see the, um, the green, but we can, you know, consider that a little bit. We certainly want to make it family friendly. Um, and that is the objective going forward. Thank you. Uh, that's all the questions I have right now. Thank you, Mr. LeBlanc. Are there any other questions from the board? Mr. Chairman? Mr. DuPont. So I have also a landscaping question and it's with other projects, we're always concerned about the durability of the plantings to make sure that they can sustain over a period of time. And I was just curious when you look, so the I know that the street is south facing and then yeah. as you sort of look at the perimeter plantings, around the rest of the building. Um, are those selected, the exact plants, are those selected taking into account the amount of sunlight that each yes, face ex will? Exactly, and why, that's exactly why there's two different communities. Okay. Um, is on the out back side, it's all selected for shade tolerance. Um, okay. And for the front, it's for sun and salt. Um, so it is a good, really different plant community. Okay, thanks. Yep. Is there anything else from the board? Mr. Hammond? I have, I have, yes, Mr. Klein. Um, just quickly, again, on the on the roof deck, the sections of planting that are at the, at the same grade, essentially, as the walkways and the, is that a covering that is something that somebody would walk on or is it still- No, the, the intention is, is be, because it can't be occupiable space um, it, for um, sort of how much occupiable space we're allowed to have um, on the, the site from, um, from code requirements is that it really can't be walkable surface. So as much as it kind of reads a little bit like it'd be a really nice lawn or place to play, um, that's not the case. This would actually be planted more of like a, a ground cover or garden kind of feeling that you're walking through. Which is nice because around the deck, you'll really feel like you're encompassed with green. The other thing, too, is with heat island effect in the city, having more and more green space is kind of a desirable thing rather than hardscape space. So um, I think it provides this kind of nice loop walk amenity while having a big open space, but other smaller places to gather as well. And is the intent to provide irrigation for the plantings? That would be the intent that um, we, we would think of certain, certainly, um, you know, on the roof deck here for sure. And that's, you know, again, I should probably turn that back over to um, to to Mary and, and Erica to really confirm that. But our suggestion would be if the project can afford it, that that would that would be the objective. Okay. Thank that's you. Mr. Have Klein. Is there anything else? Mr. Chair. Mr. Rigodelli. Um, I, I jumped on a couple of questions, so sorry, they're not in uh, coherent order, uh, but I'll ask the landscape one first uh, as we have this plan up. Um, for the um, the street tree uh, planting strip, you mentioned it's three feet wide. Um, I'm just curious, I mean, uh, in, in past projects, we've seen wider planting strips for uh, street trees. Uh, is that you know, adequate for the size of tree that you'd be expecting there? It is as long as we have the, I, so it's all about the canopy size that you're going to get on the tree long-term is very much relative to the amount of soil space that you have below it. And we call them tree coffins for a reason, right? We don't do three by three tree pits. It's, it's going to pull up the sidewalk. There's not going to be adequate um, growing room. Three by 10 is about, you know, or, you know, three by eight is about the smallest we'd really want to go when we're up at three by 10 that the tree will kind of put its roots in that soil volume if it has enough of a way to go. 
So I feel comfortable with that. And I feel that, you know, if we really kicked that, um, the curb out another foot, although it would be possible, it really starts to bring that drive aisle down to 24 and a half, which of course, you know, that would have to be a conversation on the town level, but there are a lot of big trucks and other things that come through there. So I feel like prioritizing having it match the rest of the street probably makes more sense. I, I always love to advocate for trees. So if you want to give a, you know, tell us to do that, that's great, but it'd take it out of the paving, but you know, it is a busy street too. So we'll, we'll let you guys make that decision. Okay. And thank you for that response. Um, I had one question on, on the civil um, and uh, the dry well um, that's being proposed, uh, you know, all the way to the sort of bottom plan, bottom right. Um, I, I'm just curious, actually isn't really related to the drywall so much, but um, just looking at the grading background that's being shown here, uh, are, is what we're seeing kind of just above that drywall, um, that big grade change that's being shown, is that ledge, do we know if there's any, you know, existing ledge or any uh, other sort of geological stuff going on in that part of the site that's causing that uh, extreme grade change? I'm not aware at the at this moment, but uh, when we do soil testing, I think we'll have uh, some more information regarding that. Okay. I think what you're seeing in this plan is the existing grade. Uh, this isn't these aren't the proposed grades, but rather the existing grades on site. And if you remember from being out on site, there are some sort of big soil deposits, or you know, they don't. It's not sort of a natural outcropping or something like that. I think it's you know urban fill material that's been dumped there or something like that. So. We'll obviously okay. test it and evaluate it, but I don't anticipate that there's any sort of major issue to removing it or achieving the proposed grades. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure, you know, if we're trying to infiltrate water that we're not trying to put it into rock because certainly that would create problems. Yeah, we, we have done some initial geotechnical investigations and there wasn't any evidence of bedrock on the site. So it's actually okay. quite, quite deep um, sort of uh, clayey soils. So. Okay. That's good. Uh, and the last question uh, I had was um, on the the design of the back. Um, thank you guys for um, you know taking our comments and responding. And I think uh, it's it's great to see the additional view of the back. Um, you know, my only um, concern. I, I think the approach is a nice one. Uh, my only concern is that you know I, I do feel that it you know feels a bit commercial um, because of the horizontal nature of the windows and, you know, the horizontality of that facade. Um, so, uh, you know, I'd love to hear what the other board members think, but uh, I think, you know, you guys have developed a nice design approach. My only concern is that, you know, as a residential development and trying to make this feel more residential, that uh, this feels um, much more in, in keeping with the sort of the commercial properties that are adjacent rather than the residential neighborhood that I think we're aiming to be a part of. And that's it for me, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So the chair is gonna let it go to a public hearing at this point, if there's nothing further from members of the board. Um, we, Before I do that, I wanna review some ground rules for uh, effective participation. Uh, many of you have heard these before, so I'm sorry that we have to do it each time, but public questions and comment will only be taken as it relates to the matter at hand, and it should be directed to the board for purposes of informing our decision. Uh, I, as the chair, strongly encourage individual speakers to address their comments solely to the topics that are being discussed at this hearing. Please note that it will, there will be multiple hearings scheduled for this project. The next one is July 11. And each hearing will have an opportunity for uh, public comment. The chair also encourages the public to provide written comments to be re reviewed by the board and included in the record. Um, the chair will first ask members of the public who have previously identified themselves by logging in through Zoom uh, who wish to speak to digitally raise their hand using the raised hand button in the participants tab in the Zoom application. Or maybe that's in reactions now. Um, you will be called upon by the meeting host. You may unmute yourself. You will be asked to give your name and address for the record, and you will be given up to five minutes for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. And please remember to speak 
clearly, concisely, and in a way that helps gen generate an accurate uh, weather of the meeting, excuse me, an ac accurate record of the meeting. Those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you'd like to speak. When called upon, you may unmute your line. Please identify yourself by name and address for the record, and you'll be treated in the same way as the uh, people calling in through Zoom. Once all public questions and comments have been addressed, or if we've reached the hour of, I'll say 9.15, um, the public comment period for this evening's hearing will be closed. Uh, as noted previously, there are multiple hearings scheduled for this project, and each one will have an opportunity um, for a public comment. The board, the applicant, and staff will do our best to show documents being discussed. And if you'd like a specific document to be displayed during your comment, please ask us to do so, and we'll do the best we can uh, to accommodate your request. So with that said, uh, the first person on my list, and I will try to make it get bigger, is Yvette Kavanaugh. Yvette, are you there? Apparently not. Let's, we'll try to come back to Ms. Kavanaugh uh, when we can. The next person on the list is Mikel Munoz and uh, Cabre. Thank you. Thank you for the floor. Um, I'm a resident of Mica Muñoz Cabre, 44 Michael Street. Um, um, yeah. So concern, we mentioned already many times, but we are extremely concerned about the height of the building. We think it's not uh, commensurate with the neighborhood and it sets a really bad precedent uh, for the neighborhood and it would be, I believe, the tallest in Starlington. So uh, that's on one general concern that we've expressed multiple times. Uh, seeing the shade study, uh, the shadow study, a question for the chair would be, can we have a full shadow projection with the whole circles as opposed to select hours? Because the way I saw that, uh, we have shading not only in the houses in Michael Street, but also some of the Silk Street houses are gonna be, uh, they're gonna lose their morning sun in the winter. Um, and specifically, I also want to mention, I believe those houses have not been formally notified of this project and those houses will be impacted by the project. So I believe the town should amend that by issuing formal notifications to all the, the odd number houses in Silk Street that are affected by the shade projection. Uh, I also want to note that the houses in front of us, 35 and 39 Silk Street, they have solar panels. They will have a direct economic impact from this shading in the winter. Uh, so how are you going to address that? Um, and then a different concern is regarding the box, the utility box on the top of the building. Uh, we'd like to know what is the sound level of that box. We are already impacted sometimes by the by the by the utility box of the Lachley Center, and that's much farther. So we want to know what the study of the sound sound is and how many decibels will be where. Thank you. So that's a question for the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cabrera. So we'll, why don't we see if we can't, I wonder if uh, there are three basic issues here. One has to do with height, one has to do with uh, uh, providing more detail in terms of time of day from the shadow study, and the third has to do with the utility box. And I wonder if the applicant... Uh, sorry, sorry, there was another those. one. There was another one that was notifying the neighbors in Silk Street. Uh, that's not something. That's not something that's up to the applicant this point uh, and the notifications that have been done are being done in accordance with uh, with state law and that's that's nothing not something that I can ask the applicant to address so uh, Mr. I'm, Hanlon, I'm, yes uh, there you go. I'll address the height issue this we're not seeking any waivers on the height this is just a matter of right um, uh, in this zoning district as far as the shadow study is concerned that is the is typically in the industry how shadow studies are done it at those intervals. Um, but I will um, leave it to um, Rochelle to address the Silk Street issue um, relative to um, the, uh, the casting of shadows on Silk Street. I think she said that was not an issue, Rochelle. Yeah, uh, limited. I think yeah, go ahead. It was barely touching the, the 
you know, essentially the property line of the rear yards in, in the study. And as you mentioned, the, the solstice and equinoxes are sort of taking the, the, the extreme ends of conditions. So you're getting a full range through that study. There's um, the data, the data that is relevant is captured in at those times. So is there any is there any time that is potentially relevant that would provide more detail or that would be mad that would matter or these are basically the times that that would matter that would matter in each in each case? Rochelle, can you answer that? Uh, yeah, I will. Um, I think with right with the summer solstice you're you're getting when the sun's at, at its highest, right, in the solar year. And then winter solstice ha casts the longest shadows because the sun is um, lower in the sky. It's um, rising earlier, setting sooner. And then in the equinoxes is minimal impact. So um, I think this is sort of worst case scenario. I, I don't, right. I'm not seeing what more information can provide that would be you know, we could grab a couple hours around 9 a.m. Um, if that's what's being requested, but this is sort of demonstrating, um, I, you know, I don't think as the sun starts to turn that you're going to get anything longer than this um, when the sun is high enough that you have actual solar gain in the day. And if you were looking from the point of view of Michael Street, you've got a, uh, in the evening at three o'clock, you have something, the sun goes down typically, what, for 35 o'clock? Is how is that going 30. to yeah. Is that going to change any in the next hour and a half? Um so we've got this is south facing. It's gonna move, you know, a little bit more in the It'll move in to this the west, direction. To the east, and, Craig. Right, right. So it's moving away from Michael Street, right? Okay, that sounds good. I guess the last uh, question. Can I sorry? Uh, uh, sorry, no, sorry. no, no. Ms. McCartney, sorry, you should mute yourself, and you've not been recognized. And, and but it was my question. It was my question. I, I, at two p.m. At two p.m. It's a, covering uh, those houses. As someone who who, who lives time, on thirty five Michael Street, I'm sorry. I have a, a it's time to stop. Question, it's time to stop. Wait my turn? You should wait your turn. Okay. The final question that I wanted to have uh, from Mr. Munoz uh, Cabre has to do with the uh, sound from the utility box, which I think is is related to a question that was raised by the health department. So uh, I wonder if you could address that. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming by the rooftop, the HVAC equipment up there is what's being referred to. And there are certainly, um, you know, building codes and regulations to, um, to provide guidance um, such that you're limiting what the abutting neighborhood is impacted in terms of additional noise. So, you know, as we further, as the project moves further along and specific units are specified um, as the building systems are being, um, you know, designed, um, we take those sound studies and, and, you know, sort of pair it up with what's being required. Um, and if it exceeds what, you know, what the requirements are, then there's mitigating measures to reduce the sound impact. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, the next speaker on our list is Monique Chaplin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Monique Chaplin, 35 Michael Street. Um, I had a couple of questions. Uh, one is, um, I, I wasn't completely clear with the brick pattern on the front of the building, but I had a, a concern that it, with the bricks that stick out, is there any chance that people would try to climb them to get up to the roof deck? Uh, the brick pattern happens on the underside of the entry to the building. So there's no climbing opportunity when, okay. you know, it's just at this limited portion here. So that's capped with the soffit. And then, you know, at the, we just have, you know, just the brick piers and the panel system here. Um, okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, uh, another question is, will there be uh, like flood lighting on the roof or on the sides that may impact the people living around at night with light pollution? We'd be selecting light fixtures that are careful about the throw they have. 
so that, you know, we're specifically addressing concerns about life pollution. Okay. Um, and my last uh, comment is just to reiterate uh, what's been mentioned before, which is that a five-story building here feels like it's going to dwarf everything else in the neighborhood and uh, be problematic for those of us with solar panels, even though I understand you're suggesting there's not going to be a huge amount of loss, it looks like, for at least a few hours. Um, some people with solar panels may lose our time generating time. So just want to note that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Chow. Um, whoops, Mr. Moore was next. Steve, Mr. Moore? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, I want to uh, applaud the applicant for what looks to me to be a pretty well thought through landscaping plan, which of course is always my particular interest is the, the trees and the landscaping. Um, uh, it sounds uh, pretty complete and the idea of large shade trees on the street side, I think is uh, particularly important. So that's, uh, that was good to see. Uh, a question that I have is I assume that when this building is, uh, when you know, demo happens and, and the site starts to be prepared for building that they're going to pull up the sidewalk as well. Is that correct, Mr. Chair? Ms. Zane, was that your? Yeah, Just I think a reminder there that there's there's no sidewalk on site currently. So we'll be removing the asphalt uh, apron that's in yes, front of the building and, and then repairing the street once a new sidewalk goes in. Thank you. Yeah. Right, right. Thank you. That's that. that uh, that's correct. <laughs> there is no summer. Um, my point uh, for bringing it up is that there's an opportunity there to uh, to amend whatever soil you found under underneath the asphalt and perhaps add some structural soil to allow the trees better chance for survival. Um, it is going to be, a, I assume, a, a relatively uh, harsh environment for trees with, with the trucks that go in and out and the traffic and, uh, and the salt and all that such. So, um, so that might be helpful to to provide some structured soil of some sort. Yeah, uh, definitely. I know that that's something that we always discuss with Kate and her team when we're, you know, at the planning stage. It is um, tends to be fairly costly, so it's something that we have to balance with everything else that we're trying to accommodate with the publicly funded project. But it's definitely something that we'll keep in mind in the design process. Right, right. Uh, that that that's helpful just because uh, the survivable is uh, survivability is is important. And I assume there'll be part of your plan will include um, some sort of uh, survivability plan, how long you expect them to survive, replacement within a certain number of years, those sorts of things. But I know that's, that's probably down the road uh, a little bit. Um, also, uh, lastly, in terms of irrigation, um, what sort of irrigation are you gonna be providing to the, the trees that go around the back of the building and side of the building, as well as the uh, street trees that are being planted both on the street and on the site? We haven't necessarily discussed this as a design team yet with a mm -hmm. client, but the um, the objective, what we typically suggest is that we would do a drip irrigation system in the um, buffer areas around the outside. Same thing with the roof deck. And then the actual street trees typically are not, since they're outside of the property line, usually are not connected to the private irrigation system. Usually that would be done with a tree gator bag that would then be filled. Um, and, you know, is often done by the landscape contractor who's warrantying the plant material to make it through. So they would um, take them through that first year of establishment and making sure those tree water bags are filled. So that's usually a, the approach and often we'll put two bags, you know, per tree. On the on the on the trees that are on the street. So I, I wonder if between now and and the next time when we we come back and we talk about several or, or maybe the time after that, but probably you do want to. Have, this issue is coming up several times, and probably you do want to have some sort of a discussion uh, to figure out what your approach actually is going to be towards the um, towards the irrigation. Uh, uh, so we get a get get more of a fix on on what it is that the applicant is uh, is prepared to to do in in this regard. Sure. Again, it always it, it comes down to one of these cost um, uh, analyses. Usually, often later in the design process, is so does it make sense to hand water and temporary water versus irrigation system? But we we can certainly talk through that. I guess the point of the question, I think, 
the ultimate issue is the survivability of yeah, the trees. Of course. And, of course. you know, having a nice plan that won't make it past the first summer is not very useful to anyone. So it would be helpful to have some more, some discussion of that uh, when Sounds this good. next comes up. Um, Steve, do you, Mr. Moore, do you have any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I certainly appreciate those uh, those comments, and, and yes, that would be helpful. Uh, lastly, what, uh, only in response to what they said in terms of the street trees, um, we are recommending more and more as these projects continue and throughout the town that irrigation is provided to the street trees since they're rebuilding the sidewalks and such. Um, they, there's a, an excellent opportunity to establish irrigation for those trees as well. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Moore, I wonder if if that is a conversation that the applicant could usefully usefully have with the tree warden. Yes, I think that's an excellent suggestion, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Broder. I haven't actually been asking people to give their name and address. I've given the name, but the address is unique to give. So, Ms. Broder. Hi, Leah Broder here, forty-four Michael Street. Um, thanks for the opportunity. <laughs> Um, and I'm, I'm really uh, quite pleased with uh, the landscape design and development that's happened since the last series of meetings. I think the design looks very thoughtful, um, particularly given the constraints of this massive building that's basically expanding from lot line to lot line. So my first question um, is to the lawyer who, who explained that the building can be that 56 plus feet tall as of right. Um, what, what is the current zoning for the setbacks of that property? Ms. Uh, O'Connor? I'm sorry, could she say that again? What is the... So the building can be as 56 feet, two inches as of right. And right. as of right, what is the requirement for building setbacks? Uh, we're asking for a waiver, I think on the rear a setback line. I don't have that in front of me. I don't have the whole file in front of me. I can answer that, Mary, if you'd like. It's, so there are, yeah. in the underlying zoning, there are zero foot setbacks on the front and side yards and a 20 foot setback in the rear. And we're requesting, that's one item that we're requesting relief from. Okay. Um, and so what you're show, what is currently drawn is, is a what setback from the rear? Uh, I believe it's five and a half or six feet. Five and a half or six feet. Yeah. So, so the building, you know, proportionally has expanded um, to what would be zoned as of right in terms of the the volume of the of the structure. And I think that's something when we talk about the height, we're talking about the height of the building expanding, um, you know, to all the way to the lot line on the front and the sides and five feet away um, in the rear. And so the impact of that on the neighborhood. Um, is is severe, and so I am going to add my voice to those that have already spoken um, a, a, out against having a building of this height that goes that far back on all sides, um, because I do think it has a negative impact. And if we and going back to the shadow studies for a moment, can we go to the um, to the fall spring shadow study and then to the winter? So public street, streetscape, um, thinking about the darkness that's being cast on the street and on those walkable surfaces. Um, I think this is, a, this is a real serious impact for the residents of this neighborhood, um, the darkness that is going to fall on Sunnyside Avenue. And you're seeing it from all afternoon, two of the seasons of the year. And then if we go to the winter, so in the winter, the same all afternoon, um, Sunnyside is in, is in darkness. So I, I'm just adding my voice um, there and I, I'm hopeful that there's some sort of consideration that can be made for, for those concerns, which, which are real and impact people's daily lives and the safety of walking and driving um, down those streets. So a couple of questions that I wanted to ask. One, um, the the transformer that is drawn in plan but um, has has never really been shown in elevation or any of the views. 
there's a transformer that's located on the corner of the property. Maybe you can show the site plan. So the, can you just explain what the dimensions of what we can ex anticipate for that transformer? The uh, transformer is still being coordinated and, and sized by the electrical consultant. Do you have a ballpark? Uh, they're typically like two by four. Two feet wide by four feet deep. deep and how tall? I wanna say about four feet. Okay. Um, I'm not an electrical engineer, but yeah, yeah, just as a just as a scale reference. Um, so it it looks to me like it's pretty close to the front um, lot line, and I would just ask if there's a way that that could be screened. It's it's definitely not a pretty thing to see, and it's going and it's literally hitting the lot line on one side. It. Um, so I think in terms of the impact on the street and the visual experience of walking down the street, it would be, I would like to see that um, transformer hidden. Um, a second question for you, Jeffrey, is about drainage. So um, if I'm reading the plans right, it looks like there are no overflows or drainage connections out from the water, from the stormwater drainage of the site, is that correct? Uh, no, we do. Uh, can you go to the next slide, slide please? Um, so if you're looking at where uh, dry well one is in the bottom right hand corner uh, by the transformer, actually, um, yeah. there is an existing 10 inch uh, line there where the overflow uh, Y's into that line. And that is, uh, th that's our overflow right there. I see down in the south, in the kind of plan southeast. You, you see that little stub. Uh, yeah. Input section yeah. there. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. That was a, another question. And then uh, an accessibility. We've been. You've held the floor for quite some time. Are you Sorry. getting near okay. the end? Sorry. Yes. The last question is just about ADA access to the front entrance of the um, building. I saw in the rendering that there are steps along the entire front face of the building. Um, we have. Uh, a way we we have an accessible entry that does not include the steps, um, which um, would mean well. I'll bring up this plan, but um, access that is at the level of the finished floor ground would be over towards the um, left side of the building. But the 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 sunny side has grades down, um, and so there will be some steps to accommodate the grading. But there is accessible access with no handrails, just, you know, the, the requirement of one to two. So, so from that view right there where it says building above, that's the folks would like, if they had a mobility device, they'd roll straight in right there. There's they have to... for them to roll and, and turn to enter either, either entry that they would prefer. It's, it's fully accessible. Once you're under the building, that's all one, one datum. Okay, I guess I just was reading. Okay, that's great. Hey, um, thank you, Ms. Brutter. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Han Mr. Hanlon, may I just briefly respond? Uh, it's appropriate. Actually, I can't tell who just spoke. Is that Ms. O'Connor? It's uh, Attorney O'Connor. Yes, okay. Oh, yes. I, I just want to point out, um, I do not think that that assessment of the shadow study is accurate. And I want to point out that there is a lighting plan. There'll be perimeter lighting. Uh, the, pedest the, the walkway will have pedestrian activity. That end of Sunnyside Ave is a very dark uh, end and we've heard the residents talk about it being scary even. Uh, this will bring life to it and lighting as well. The other thing is I wanna point out is that this applicant is in, based on my experience in doing these, asking for very limited waivers. Um, and we're not seeking a waiver on FAR or on, on height. Uh, so I just want to point those things out. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, the next speaker is uh, Ms. McCartney. 
Mary McCartney. Yes, uh, thank you. And sorry for the uh, sound mishap earlier. Um, I, okay, so I uh, I am a butter and a butter on, on Michael Street, and I am I, I wanted to talk again about the. Uh, Ms. The McCartney, could you give your address, please? Oh yeah, thirty five Michael Street. Thank you. Okay, so if you could bring up the light study again, please. So the so the, the on Michael Street, there's well, there's the house on the corner. the 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 next two houses um, both have solar panels, and um, I can see where the you know the summer doesn't seem to be any problem in the summer, but it does look to me like if you can go to the Equinox, uh, well, it's the winter. I mean, it looks to me like it's very possible that um, certainly between noon and three, that there might be some blockage on the on Michael Street for those two houses that have solar panels. And I'd I'd, I'd like a little more detail. I'm wondering if um, that because that does affect two abutters who've had, I, we've had solar panels for 10 year, over 10 years. Um, I'd like to have some assurance that it's not gonna affect our solar panels. Is that something that could be done? For 35 and also um, the house next to us. Zane, could you take a, take a, uh, take a look at that for next time? Yeah, you're asking if we can show shadows at, at two o'clock, one o'clock. Right. The yeah. idea basically we, is you've got those two houses that are next to the one that's in shade. Yeah. And the one that's in shade may very well. I mean, there's other things that are also casting the shade. But the question really is, is if you look at some time that's in the vicinity of three o'clock, whether or not a little bit later, it's going to be rotating further to the east. And the question, I guess, really is whether a little bit earlier it will be, it's more likely to be catching the houses with solar that are adjacent to the one that's affected now. Yes, that's yeah, we can. We, okay. we can do that. I did want to note that, you know, at the winter solstice, you'll be receiving at least in terms of your solar intake for PVs, especially in the, you know, in the afternoon. Um, but certainly we will we'll, we'll show those. Okay, we, thanks. We, we should at least know. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank and, you very much. Uh, this is more of a, a procedural question because a lot of us ask questions about uh, like traffic and, and routing traffic last last in the last meeting. And I I guess I, I was thinking that there might be some conversation about that tonight. Is is the perception that you've addressed all the traffic concerns or um, because I, I guess I was expecting to hear something about that. Tonight we're not. Uh, tonight the agenda is what, what we said. We have, excuse me, on July 11th, we will be having our, excuse me, the boards will be retaining a, a, peer, group, a peer consultant who will, between now and then, be preparing a report, which will, among other things, be addressing transportation issues. And I would imagine that those were that, but it's so I said last time, and uh, the experts' report will be part of the agenda on July 11th. Okay, great. Thanks. I appreciate that information. And I, I just do want to weigh in again and with some of the previous speakers and, and just say that I, I really do think this is out of scale for the neighborhood. As much as I appreciate the, the need for affordable housing, I just think this is just plain too big. Um, okay, thank thank you for listening. I'm all set. Next on my list, thanks, Mr. Mc is um, Neil Mongold. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Neil Mongold, 12 Brattle Place in Arlington, and I am a board member of the Housing Corp of Arlington. I just wanted to um, say a couple words and have a couple questions. Um, I wanted to applaud the architects and the landscape architect for the treatment of the, the raised um, uh, deck garden area. I think uh, it really creates uh, kind of what I would call a green oasis on the otherwise narrow and kind of bleak sunny side at that end of the street. And so I think, I really think that it's uh, it will be a great amenity um, 
And I think also in, in thinking about uh, the shadow studies and so on, the way that the building sets back with that kind of L shape, um, I think it's important to think not only in terms of shadows, but also kind of turning it around the other way and looking up, it's the view of the sky, uh, which is, is kind of a different way of thinking about the light that gets down into uh, the street area there. And I think um, the fact that the building pulls back like that really offers a view of the sky and the ambient light will filter down um, in a nice way onto, onto um, Sunnyside. Um, I did have a question about, um, there, was a, there was a lot of talk about the irrigation, uh, both on the, the roof deck and the plantings behind the building. And it's kind of ironic, and maybe the civil engineer uh, can talk about this, that on the one hand, we have um, stormwater infiltration underneath the building. Um, I wonder if there's a possibility that some of that stormwater could be stored in a cistern and reused for irrigation purposes, or possibly a, a stormwater storage at the deck level that might be able to be used so that we wouldn't have to be uh, paying for municipal water to, to irrigate. Um, and then um, my last question is, there was talk at the last meeting also about um, a drop-off pickup area in front of the building. And um, I just wanted to uh, hear if uh, there'd been some thought about the placement of the street trees in relation to that drop-off pickup area along the front of the building. Thank you. Thank you. So I wonder, I guess, Probably Ms. Ain again is the one to address some of these. Where on the on the irrigation one, uh, um, just kind of. Sure, I think um, again, I think we should probably continue the conversation on ir irrigation at a but it's a, a great point about the um, cistern, and we can bring it up and talk to the civil and the client about that. Um, in terms of the, the the trees, the trees were definitely considered to have um, good flow of pedestrian access in and out to so the placement to have kind of uh, good flow there. And I don't know, um, Rochelle, if you want to bring up the site plan again quickly, but um, the idea there is that is we do kind of keep clear of the pedestrian um, doorways and things to keep um, good uh, direct access into the into the building doors for when there are drop offs along the street. Mr. Mnongo, yeah, in say, regards to the drop off, you're, yes, you, you echoed my response, so thank you. Great, thank you very much. Okay, the next next person on the list is is uh, Karina Liendo. Hi, I'm a resident in 39 Michael Street. So I just want to add my concern uh, about the shadow. So I'm also, I'm, I'm, I'm the neighbor of Mary. Um, so I second the request of her to get more details in this study. It's also going to affect the uh, house in the corner, um, sunny side with Michael. Um, they don't, she doesn't have any panel, but uh, still I think her light is going to be very affected um and also we'll also uh add that uh again we are not against the um affordable housing but uh we are really concerned for the size of this building hey thank you so there's nobody else that is signed up for a first time around. Uh, Ms. Broder, if you want to, did you had your hand up a moment ago? Do you want to go again, or do you? Was that just left up from before? Benign neglect. My apologies. Okay. Thank you. All right. Was well, going once, going twice. There's, I don't see anyone else with a hand up. Uh, so let me just close the public comment for this hearing now. Uh, thank for thank you for all of you who have contributed um, to the hearing. Um, we'll take a few more minutes uh, to allow members of the board uh, any uh, follow-up questions that they might have uh, in light of what, what we've just said. Uh, is there anybody who who has any questions or comments? Mr. Hanlon. 
Mr. Klein. Um, just in regards to the, so there have been several questions about the impact on the solar um, at 35 and 39 Michael Street. Um, I know that the applicant is going to be taking a look again at the solar studies. Um, I think it might be helpful to if, if there's a way to sort of have a, you know, quantitative uh, approach to it too, to sort of say, you know, it will, the that area will be in shadow, you know, X percentage of the time that it normally would you know, be open, just so we have a, a way of understanding sort of the, the overall impact um, as, as it goes forward. So if we could do that, that, that would be helpful. Yeah, thank you. It's an excellent suggestion. Yeah, I have one question that I'd like to, the question of height has come up over and over again. Um, and uh, at this point, uh, it's come up solely as, as a matter of how uh what the what what sort of massing uh, a building of the size and and shape uh would have and i wonder if the applicant could spend a few minutes saying suppose suppose uh you were suppose we insisted that we wouldn't uh approve a five story building and we would only approve a four story building and i think some of the neighbors have asked for even shorter than that what would you and we in the town lose um, if you lost that story. Well, what would be the uh, consequences. Eric can also speak to this, but it would not. This project would not be um, reasonable to go forward with. Um, you know, um, the the state has looked at this. Um, DHCD has approved this. Um, this is an appropriate use of the site. It's well within most of the zoning requirements on the site um and uh erica could speak further to it it would not be feasible for the housing corporation of arlington and you would lose a very viable project and i would suggest one other thing what the town would lose the board of selectmen made it very clear that they view this project as something that's going to revitalize this area they're looking to revitalize this area of broadway uh, and the, and this is one of the steps towards it. This is an ideal location for affordable housing, given the shopping, uh, given the MBTA access, uh, and uh, I think it would be, be something that the town would uh, would sorely lose out on. Erica, do you want to add to that? No, I think I captured it. Yeah, we would risk making this financially infeasible. So it would um, when we looked at the site, we considered you know, what looked possible with the existing zoning, even if we didn't use the 40B tool. Um, and so from, from day one thought, oh, we, you know, we could do a, a building of this height, even if we didn't pursue it under 40B. And that was part of the calculus of if we felt that this site was feasible at all to do, to do this project. So would it be fair to say that, that if, if you didn't have the fifth story, you wouldn't have the building at all. I don't know. I'm I'm looking at I'm looking on my screen at our real estate consultant Gabby Geller, and I yeah I um it's it's a tight budget now, so I'm not sure how we'd make it work if we had to remove I don't know how many I, how many units are on each floor, but if we had to remove that number of units and the related subsidy that we get, I'm not sure if it would work. Yeah, this is uh, I can. Oh. Skeleton? It's very different. It's Sorry. very different. Uh, let me just say this. This is not your typical developer doing 15 uh, affordable units at 80% of the median. This is um, a not-for-profit doing all of the units. It's at 60%, isn't it, Erica? That's the max. I mean, some are yeah. below. Yeah. Some are below that. So it's a very, very tight budget. Sorry, Gabby. Oh, that's okay. Um, so I'm Gabby Geller, I'm the development consultant, also an East Arlington resident. Um, the sales of this property was quite high. And as you all know, you know, housing price, real estate prices in Arlington have been quite high for some time. And in order to really make that uh, the, the project feasible, and even to start to think that we could afford to purchase this property, um, it was very important to get at least a certain number of units, and we don't have those number of units with that 
the current configuration. UTL worked really hard to try to take what we needed to do and make that as sort of as livable and as as fitting into the neighborhood fabric as possible. I think they've done a great great job. Um, we definitely understand in here that people think it's too large, um, but it really like the the numbers on projects like this. Everything is very tight, as Mary said. This is not a for profit. This is to build a building that can accommodate people of very low to low incomes. Um, and to make the project functional so it can keep up with its maintenance obligations and continue to be a good neighbor. Thank you very much. Is there anything else from a member of the board? Mr. Chair. Mr. Holy, yes. Um, as, as we're listening to the height of the building being a problem, it's just more a question for the architect with the 10 foot six floor to floor height, is there something to give away to reduce the height and just reduce the massing to the best we could, you know, best of what we could do with what we have? Mr. Burens? Sure, I can answer that. I mean, we'll, we'll certainly look, um, you know, through the design process to limit the overall height of the building as much as possible. I think what we've planned on so far is sort of very standard practice in terms of what's needed to build a building like this, which will have a steel structure on the ground floor to span over the parking, which has a certain amount of depth, and then, um, you know, open web wood trusses for some of the larger spans up above, which have to accommodate mechanical distribution and plumbing and everything else for the unit. So we're really not proposing anything extravagant here. It's really to get, you know, um, dignified, uh, you know, living spaces for the tenants and to, you know, provide the infrastructure for the building. Um, there's really nothing, nothing in excess here to give away. If we can scrape off an extra six inches, we'll certainly do that. Is um, the structure above um, the level two, would that be a wood structure, is it? Or, uh, that, that would all be a light framed wood structure, yes. yes. And there the ceiling height is, um, what would be the ceiling height with the 10, six as a floor to floor? In the units, it usually ends up being about eight and a half feet. Okay. Yeah. Plus or minus. Okay. Mr. Burns, Mr. Okay. Burns, could you? Thank you. This is right next to a fairly large building on the corner of uh, Sunnyside. How much taller is this building than the than its neighbor on Broadway? Are you referring to the one at the corner of Broadway yeah. and Sunnyside? Yes. I don't know exactly off the top of my head, but we could try to evaluate that. I'm not sure that we know exactly how tall that building is. Um, probably something on the order of 15 feet, I would guess, off the top of my head, but we can look at that more closely. All right, are there any other questions from the board? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll close the, the, the session uh, uh, the session of the hearing. Um, thank you all for your participation and I appreciate everyone's patience uh, and appreciate everyone's uh, assistance in preparing for and hosting the online meeting, including and especially Vincent Lee, who has ably stepped in uh, to uh, uh, retake his whole role uh, with Ms. Ralston on vacation. Um, please, everyone note that the purpose of the board's recording is to ensure creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. It's our understanding that the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at ACMI TV within the coming days. Um, if anyone has uh, any comments or recommendations, uh, please send them uh, via email to uh, cba at town.arlington.ma.us. Uh, that email address is also listed on the ZBA uh, website. So the next scheduled time for a hearing uh, here in which we'll be dealing through the civil and transportation aspects uh, of the uh, of the peer consultant's report uh, is July 11th. Um, and the chair would entertain a motion to continue uh, this hearing to a date certain of uh, of uh, July 11th at 7.30 uh, p.m. Mr. Hanlon. Mr. Klein. I move that the Zoning Board of Appeals continue the hearing on, on 10 Sunnyside Avenue to a date certain July 11th, 2023 at 7.30 p.m. Second. There is second. Um, I have to, have to go through and I've lost my little card, so I'm going to forget who... who somebody again. Um, all right, so we'll take a roll call vote. Mr. DuPont? 
Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Uh, Mr. Holy? Aye. Uh, Mr. Klein? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. Mr. Ricardelli? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So this hearing is continued. Uh, just as an announcement uh, uh, to all of you, uh, uh, I'm expecting that uh, the, excuse me, uh, we have another hearing, a regular hearing between now and July 11th. Uh, it has, if I'm not mistaken, four cases on it now, uh, and that will be on June 27th. So that will be the next time when we get together to enjoy each other's company. Um, and everybody here is quite welcome to attend if they are so inclined. Um, and uh, I think then, then after July 11th, we will have to be uh, considering how to move forward given the summer uh, on this case uh, with an effort to get through it and to, and to not get that close to the 180 days that we have statutorily. Um, so if, is there, are there any other announcements or anything else before I entertain a motion to adjourn? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ms. O'Connor. Thank you, everybody uh, who participated uh, and for the enlightening discussion. Um, the chair, at this point, will, will uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Mr. Chair, so Mr. moved. Klein. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by, uh, I'm sorry. I'm losing. Seconded by Roger, wherever you are. Yes, it was. Um, Mr. DuPont, um, all of, we'll go through the list again. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Ms. Holy. Aye. Mr. Klein. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. And the chair will go along with the majority and vote aye. And we are adjourned. Thank you for it. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Well,